First question is, what is one commonly misunderstood ingredient in pet food? Uh, probably meat meals like chicken meal, beef meal. Um, they're a very processed ingredient and people, there's nothing like it in human food. So we have very little understanding of what those are. It, it's a powder. It, it looks like dirt all of those meal ingredients. So that's a very misunderstood ingredient. Excellent. And we'll jump into detail on that in a moment. But next, I want to know, would you ever personally purchase a pet food made with feed grade ingredients or meat? Absolutely not. No, I, 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 that is something you, you have no guarantee to the quality of, of anything feed grade. And it can, it can run the gamut too. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, how important is it to understand the difference between processed and ultra processed foods when it comes to picking a food for our dogs? Uh, it's, it's very important. And there we can go by the same standards that human food is rated as minimally processed or ultra processed. And it's the ultra processed that is scientifically many, many different science papers published on the health risk of ultra processed. Very, very well said. And so we are going to deep dive into those three topics. Plus, if we have time and you stay tuned, we will be talking about some recent recall updates. Uh, but first, I want to do a more formal and worthy introduction of my awesome guest here, Susan Thixton, who is what I would call the voice of pet parent consumers fighting to hold the pet food companies, manufacturers, uh, accountable for the decisions that they make and the marketing that they portray to us and is the founder of The Truth About Pet Food, which is an awesome platform to educate and inform and empower pet parents to make uh, the best decisions for their dog's food, as well as, like I said, holding accountable these uh, manufacturers. So it is an honor and a pleasure. I've learned so much from you, Susan, and I'm very excited uh, to pick your brain today <laughs> on essentially what we as pet parent consumers need to know about our dog's food. So let's jump right into it. Uh, the first topic we're going to go into is going to be ingredients, uh, the ingredients on our dog's food, what to look out for, what are some red flags. So let's start with that. What are some uh, red flags or, again, we talked about meat meals, like commonly misunderstood ingredients that we should really be prioritizing when we're looking at and researching into what's in our dog's food? The, the biggest thing is is not necessarily an ingredient but it's a quality of ingredient pet foods pet food ingredients are either food human grade like our food or they are feed grade uh, the fda allows pet food to violate federal law federal law the federal food drug and cosmetic act says that all foods, animal and human, uh, cannot contain any part of a diseased animal or an animal that has died other than by slaughter. But the FDA gives expressed direct permission to the pet food industry that allows them to use diseased animals and animals that have died other than by slaughter and process it into pet food. That's feed grade. So feed grade is not only quality of ingredients, but it is also quality of manufacturing. In human food, for any food that contains more than 3% meat, the USDA is on site in that manufacturing facility, making sure that federal law is abided by. With pet food, which contains more than 3% meat, the USDA is not on site. Um, and to give you an example of what can happen, what is allowed to happen, several years ago, there was an inspection, an FDA inspection done at a Mars pet care facility, I believe in Ohio. 
and they found, quote, millions of roaches in the food production area. There was no recall. Uh, there was no warning letter sent telling them to clean up the pet food plant. In fact, the FDA, there was a recall a year earlier, which they did note, uh, but that was for pathogenic. Yeah, this is Smith. She likes Thank to uh, participate in interviews, and this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, this, this, pest infestation continued for two years and, and that was just accepted. The FDA didn't like it. They, they asked the manufacturer to clean it up, but they didn't have to. So that's the huge thing that pet owners need to realize is there is a difference. Now, does that mean that all feed grade ingredients are diseased animals or animals that have died other than by slaughter? No, but you have no guarantee with human food manufacturing and a pet food that says the words human grade on the label, that is a guarantee that all ingredients are human edible, meet the same standards as human food, and all manufacturing is per human food safety laws. And pay no attention to, to website claims of human grade this, human grade that. That is not verified. The only place it is verified is when that statement is on the label. On the actual physical, on the physical project. Pro product. Yes. Yes. And so you say that human grade, in order for it to be human grade, that, that can also apply to the supplements or the vitamin synthetic packs that they use in there as well, right? Like those can be Absolutely. labeled as human grade or, or feed grade. Can you tell me yeah. a little more about that? Well, uh, several years ago, there was an ingredient up for approval. I go to all the regulatory meetings where they define these ingredients. And there was a, a, a supplement. Now, this supplement is more used in livestock feed than pet food, but it's a good example. Zinc hydroxychloride was this ingredient. Three veterinarians went to the microphone and objected to the approval of this ingredient. It was allowed to contain high levels of lead. It is an ingredient, I live in Florida, and it is an ingredient that they use to clean algae off of roofs of houses. Um, three vets spoke against it. They passed it anyway. So, um, you know, and, and if you have multiple supplements that are allowed to contain a certain percentage of lead, in one alone, that, and it, it, it's pretty high, in one alone, that's not bad, but you add 10 different supplements that all contain lead, cumulatively, this is a problem for this pet eating this food every day. So feed grade is held to a much lower standard than human grade food grade. So is it safe to say that really the only way we would know if the food we're feeding our dogs, supplements, vitamin synthetics, fillers included, are human grade, which clearly we're saying is very important, is really to reach out to the manufacturer directly, right? Because yes, we can look at the packaging, but sometimes they don't always say it in my experience um, or can be misleading in other similar type terminology. Would you agree? Well, if the label states human grade, right. okay, on the front of the package, if you see those words human grade, then you know everything in that product and manufacturing processes is human edible, meets the same standards as for human food. But there are companies that maybe the food is made in a pet food plant, but they use human edible ingredients, human edible supplements. Um, so yeah, you do have to ask the manufacturer and unfortunately you have to hope they're telling you the truth. Right. And that's a big value of those watching this, if they were to go to your website, The Truth About Pet Food, and, and follow your work, is that uh, you dedicate your life to holding account, holding these brands and manufacturers accountable and, and figuring this information out for us. So um, on behalf of all pet parents, thank you. So 
when we think about, so one thing I want to clarify and correct me if I'm wrong is my understanding is that when we think about feed grade and human grade, I think a lot of people get confused with um, good versus bad in terms of like food. So a lot of people think that all raw food is human grade or and all kibble is feed grade. But my understanding is that's not accurate. You can have a feed grade quality raw food or cooked food, and you can even have a human grade quality uh, kibble. Is that accurate? Um, extrusion, pet foods that are made through extrusion, which is a, a process of how they manufacture. Um, to my knowledge, right up to now, uh, there is no human grade extruded kibble, but there are baked kibbles right. that are human grade, meet all the requirements of the human grade standards. And you're absolutely right. People, and I, I get this too a lot from people, they think, oh, well, I'm just going to feed raw. I feed raw. I'm fine. No, not necessarily. There are some raw manufacturers that these companies are also have a USDA license to be a dead animal hauler. So imagine a cow that died in the field. It laid there for three days. This truck comes and picks it up. It takes it to this plant. They chop it up, grind it up, and that becomes your raw pet food. Do you really want to be feeding that? And for my pets, absolutely not. So, um, it, it makes no difference, the style of pet food. They can be both human grade and feed grade. And you've got to, well, you don't have to, but I do. <laughs> I have to, before I feed anything to my animals, uh, I have to assure myself that the meats, the supplements, the, the manufacturing process, all meets a high safety standard, human grade. Human grade. Now, and I agree with you. Um, it's something, you know, we talk a lot about uh, on my platforms about the importance of, of human grade. But one thing I wanted to clarify with you as well that I'm asked quite a bit is uh, human grade doesn't necessarily mean automatically that the animals were raised humanely or free range, pasture raised, gap rated, et cetera. Um, it's usually more likely in my experience, but it's definitely not a guarantee. There's not a direct correlation there in all situations. Is, is that accurate? Yeah. It, it, that's a whole nother level, which I try to do as well. Um, my animals probably eat more <laughs> humanely raised meats than I do, but I try that for myself as well. Um, that, that, you know, to me, if an animal has to give its life to feed me or to feed my animals, then at least during that animal's lifespan, let's treat it properly and let's feed it what mother nature intended to feed it. And I mean, what they, the factory farmed animals I mean, it, it's horrible what they feed them. Literally, chicken poop. I kid you not. Chicken poop is a legally defined ingredient that they feed to cattle. And cow poop, they don't use the word poop. I'm trying to be G-rated here. Um, um, but cow poop is a legally defined ingredient for chicken feed. So uh, the same garbage, it's waste, is th that's the mindset, and it's so sad, the mindset of the feed industry is to use as much waste as possible because it's cheap, it's inexpensive. Now, we as consumers do want, you know, we have bills to pay and we have to keep a roof over our heads, so we do want to, to buy economical food. We don't want to spend that uh, $15 for a very small grass-fed steak. Right. But um, it, it, it's respect of the animal that gave its life. It is nutritionally, they have, have evidence proving that nutritionally 
th these animals that are treated properly also uh, the 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 products the meats that that we are provided by from them are nutritionally superior to factory farmed animals right yeah i think that's probably one of the most underrated uh topics to discuss is that of course we want the animals that we're feeding our animals and ourselves to be raised responsibly respect fully, ethically, but there is evidence, as you said, that there are, it's more nutrient dense um, and better for our environment. That's a whole nother topic um, to support. But brand. it plays a role in all of this, I, you know, and, and even if you can't buy that humanely raised human grade pet food all the time, if you can feed some of it, yeah. you know, just some, for one, you're doing the best you can for your pet. And for two, you're supporting a company that's doing it right. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that's interesting because, you know, one of the questions on my mind is, as you're talking about feed grade comes to why, right? Like why are these, which I, I know what you're going to say, but, you know, I think a lot of people wonder why are why is this so prevalent to have feed grade and these diseased animals um, and these poor low quality ingredients in our pets' food? And I think your answer might be money, um, but I'd love to hear your response to that. Yeah, it, it's it's cheap, you know. And then they can they can they make more money per pound. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's sold for some of them aren't um, some of them are it, it's ridiculous what some of them are sold for there is well uh, origin as example champion pet food and this is something that that more people should understand now they're owned by Mars but uh, years ago when gravy train and kibbles and bits had that recall pentobarbital recall. So when there's a recall, FDA goes to that facility or sends a state authority to that facility and they do a trace forward and trace backwards investigation. Trace forward is to see where all that recalled pet food went to, to make sure all the distributors, retailers were notified to pull it off of store shelves. Trace backwards is to see where the ingredient came from, perhaps if that same ingredient went into any other batches. Well, in their trace backwards investigation, they tracked down the supplier. It was a fat ingredient. And that same supplier shipped pentobarbital pentobarbital contaminated fat to champion pet food and so if you think how expensive champion pet food is it was using the same fat and i i know all of this from freedom of information act requested documents um champion pet food was using the same quality of fat as gravy train but think of the price differences there you know huge so um and that's similar to human food, right? Where it really comes down to marketing. Like you might be buying one food product to, to purchase for yourself. Um, and then there's another one that seems because of the claims on the packaging to be much healthier, they're really the one and the same. And I think, you know, this reminds me of what I always say is that big pet food, if you will, the big five or whatever the number is now, um, is really the, they're the greatest marketers of all time, because if you if you if you uncover and, and the misleading tactics they're doing and doing the research that you're doing, you learn that it's it's really all just junk and crap in a lot of ways. Not all food, but like kind of what we're talking about here. And I think feed that's really telling. Yeah, feed grade. Yeah, um, yeah. it's really scary. It's really scary because it's it's um it's not as nutrient dense and as you said, sometimes it's very expensive. Like what you're paying for is not what you're getting or what, what you think you're getting. Well, the, and, and this is, this is a sticking point for me uh, and why there's laws against it, but nobody enforces them uh, is the misleading images on packages. So there's that picture of a roasted chicken, beautiful. Um, sometimes it's a chicken breast with the grill marks on it, beautiful. I've called these companies, 
it, is the chicken in your food roasted? Well, no. Is the chicken grilled? Well, no. Well, that that image is a lie. You, you know, I mean, that flat out and simple, that image is a lie then. But nobody enforces it. Yep. And it, that reminds me of the, the salt divider rule, which I, I know you're very familiar with. But for those watching where you might see on the front of the bag, these fresh fruits and veggies, and it has all these claims, probiotics added and digestive enzymes and antioxidant produce. But then you look at the ingredient deck and you see salt. And the rule, and correct me if I'm wrong, is anything after salt can represent up to 1% of the total bag of food. So it's really yeah. negligible in most situations and really misleading, which is, again, why I call them um, the greatest marketers all the time, not ethically, but in terms of their ability to uh, convince some extremely intelligent human beings um, that poor quality food is actually good is, is really remarkable. Honestly, it's unfortunate, but it is remarkable. <laughs> so let's look into, so ingredients. So um, I think what's interesting to me is there's a lot of confusion when we're looking at the back of the bag and we see meal. You brought up meals before because there's more than just meat meal. There's bone meals, there's uh, poultry meals, uh, byproduct, animal byproduct meals, poultry byproduct meals. What's a good way for us to kind of understand, um, one, are these healthy uh, to feed our animals? And two, is there anything we should be looking out for when we're looking at ingredients that contain the word meal? Meal ingredients. You can go to my website and on any post along the side, in the sidebar, there is... Um, I made these PDFs. Oops. Okay. And the dog is hung in my sweater. Um, and I went and then I've got posts on this of rendering facilities um, of what's really in there. And uh, so I went to Google Earth Images and took, got images from Google Earth of different rendering facilities all across the United States. And, you know, in the middle of a parking lot, is a big mound of carcass parts or whole animal carcasses, blood everywhere all over the parking lot, trailers waiting to dump, sitting out in the sun. They're, they're not transported under refrigeration. You know, they're out in the elements, blood draining from these trailers. And, and so many times these facilities are next to water, like a river or, and think of the wash off. Think if these were diseased animals, that disease just went into the water system somehow. Um, so then this big mound uh, of, of dead animal carcass are bulldozed into a big pit. They're ground then they're cooked, and then the fat is separated from the solids, then they're dried, and it's literally a powder. So, I mean, that's as, that's as ultra-processed as you can get. Then you can take that ultra-processed ingredient, put it into an extruded kibble, which is an ultra-processed manufacturing uh, style, and it, it, it's you, you've got problems. Then you you're you're linking your pet to uh, you're risking your pet to to illness and disease. Yeah. Um, so would you avoid foods that use meat meals, byproduct meals in all cases? All cases. Okay. All cases. I would never give my pets a you know a. a rendering industry um, quality ingredient, no matter what it is. Yeah. Now are rendered meats the same as meat meals or meat yes. meal by byproducts? Okay, yes. so they're yes. one and the same. Okay. Yes. Okay, interesting. And there's there's actually like lard. If you bought lard at the grocery store, that's mm -hmm. a rendered ingredient. So there's two different types of rendering facilities. One is called an integrated facility, and they're attached to a USDA slaughter facility. 
Um, if they're manufacturing human edible rendered products, which is just the fats, USDA, again, this is under U USDA jurisdiction, uh, they are there to oversee to make sure all of human food law is abided by. Then there's another building that is not under USDA jurisdiction. And this can be just leftovers. Um, say it's a poultry processing facility. Once they remove the meat, there's frames. The, the skeletal frames left can be cooked. The skin, chicken necks. It could be, you know, decent um, quality that can be rendered and become chicken meal. But it can also, from these integrated facilities, it can also be... Um, the, the carcasses that were condemned or tissues that were condemned. Um, then there's independent rendering. And the independent renderers are the worst. That's the images that I have on my website. It's, it's disgusting uh, what, what they have. A pet owner in Denver, Colorado, there's a rendering facility coming into Denver, like you fly into Denver, and when you're coming into the city, there's a pure, I don't know what the interstate name is, um, but there's a Purina pet food plant, and then right next to it is a rendering facility, a Darling Ingredients. And she, this young woman was going to a party at one o'clock in the morning, a warehouse party. She's young. She's still up at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> And her GPS system on her phone turned her into the wrong place. And she looks, and, and these are on my website as well, too, She because she sent me the pictures. She looks out her car window, and there's this building with a mound of dead hog carcasses. I mean, it's a mound. And it, it scared her half to death. She didn't know what it was. You know, she's thinking horror flick. You know, what is this? And it's a rendering facility, you know, it's, it's, they're awful what they, this is a direct violation of federal law for those, an animal that has died other than by slaughter. That's federal law that is not allowed in human food or animal food, but the FDA intentionally allows it to be used in animal food because it's basically waste disposal. And can that occur in food that is legitimately human, pet food that's human grade? Absolutely not. No, no, no. That's disgusting and it's unnerving and it's unfortunate that this is, and this is a, I mean, again, let me know if I'm wrong, but this is a fairly common practice to use these rendered meal Oh yeah, there's meal billions, products. billions of pounds every right. year. I get from USDA, uh, it, they release the information quarterly of how many billions of, of just condemned animal carcasses. So th if they're condemned by the USDA, that meant the animal was killed, slaughtered, but then the carcass is condemned. This doesn't even, and, and that's billions of pounds in a quarter. Um, Nevertheless, the animals that don't even make it that far, that die on the factory farms. In, I think it was 2017 when the, there was that big flood in North and South Carolina, Hurricane Florence maybe. Um, there's a lot of factory farms, poultry and hog um, factory farms, which are just big barns. These animals never see the light of day. Well, those barns flooded and the animals drowned in their barns. When the floodwaters went down, guess where those dead decomposing animal carcasses went to? Were allowed to go to without disclosure to the consumer. You know, you're not told. You, you can call up your manufacturer and go, well, I want to know if you use this. And of course, they're all going to say, well, absolutely not. Yeah. What a manufacturer will tell pet owners, pet owners will ask, is your meat USDA inspected and passed? That's the question you want to ask. Inspected 
and past? And a pet food manufacturer will answer, oh yes, all of our meats come from USDA facilities. Well, that wasn't answering your question. Condemned material comes from USDA facilities. So when you ask the question, make sure they are answering what you asked. That's interesting. Um, gosh, this is just, I, I, I have all these questions and all these things, but I'm trying to stay on topic <laughs> because you are just, um, you are so valuable in, in what you're sharing. And this is so important because like we said before, these are not uncommon practices and the likelihood that somebody watching this is currently feeding or is about to buy a bag of food that uses some of this is, is really, really high, which is why you and as well as myself dedicate so much time to educating on topics like this. Um, another ingredient that is bothersome to me, and um, I don't know your thoughts on it, are when they use things like natural flavorings, because my understanding is there's very little regulation to that, and natural flavoring can even include other meat sources like seafood or poultry in a beef-only food, um, pieces of bark, leaf, things like that. Uh, and it's hard for me to – I mean, I wouldn't want to feed a food that uses natural flavoring because – I want the brand to be transparent about what's in it. And I don't know what that means. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, they, and they won't tell you either. That was discussed at a, a pet food regulatory meeting, at an AFCO meeting. And I asked the FDA during the meeting, you know, what's, what's in natural flavoring? And the FDA said, well, it's proprietary information. And I, I said, well, what do you mean? Why would it be proprietary? It's, it's in a pet food. The pet owner should know what's in there. And she said, no, that's proprietary. It's similar to a chef's recipe, which I have an expletive that I normally say after that, but I won't say today. Yeah. <laughs> you get a little G-rated here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's insane. And um, I, I actually just thought of something real quick. I want to go back to the rendered because I was just thinking of this um, and the meat meals. I saw somebody a question come in through is on this as well. But what if the manufacturer says, "Oh, like when we when we." put on their chicken byproduct meal, for example, it's only chicken necks, it's only human grade um, pieces of the chicken, no disease. Like, is that enough to be okay with feeding that ingredient? Would you say for you and, and your pets? It wouldn't be for me. Okay. I'd, I would then um, ask them, um, can you provide me evidence? Okay, if it's only USDA inspected and passed ingredients, then, then give me some evidence or um, have them sign and notarize, put that in writing. It's only, and, and they won't do it. I, I, I would bet money <laughs> yeah. and, and say, okay, that's great. Uh, if you can't give me verification, then put it in writing that everything is human grade and have that notarized. Yeah. You know, and ask them to send you that document. They Are won't there do it. Are there any other, for the ingredient deck, any other really commonly misunderstood ingredients we haven't covered um, that you find to be very problematic? It's, oh, well, it, it, it's, it's so many. On. There, I mean, it's, it's all of them. They can be taken in different perspective. As example, chicken. Okay, it's the most common ingredient. Chicken meal actually is the most common used ingredient. But if the label says chicken, our brains go to, if we bought a TV dinner and it said chicken TV dinner and it had a picture of fried or roasted chicken breast on the label, that's exactly what's going to be in that TV dinner or this company would be in big trouble. Right. But the legal definition of chicken is that it can be chicken skin, chicken bones, um, it can be meat, but it doesn't have to be. It can be any of those individual things or a combination of all of them. So, and, and AFCO has made the ingredient definitions public, but you have to go through a whole process to find them. If you go to the AFCO website, 
aafco.org. Uh, and they just redid their website, so I don't know where they're at, but you can look around. And and I encourage pet owners to do that. It's a it's a big document, a PDF like document, and uh, you can download those and read the definitions, read what they are um, in your pet's food. But just as example with chicken, you, you know, there can be so many different things of what that actually means because we have these catch-all ingredient definitions to keep things hidden from pet owners. Yeah. And that's, re I mean, that really, because otherwise, why not just be completely transparent with what's in the food and giving the response of its proprietary, I think is is laughable. I get that there is competition, especially for smaller brands, right? Like it can be tough, but at the end of the day, um, we deserve to know what we're feeding. Now, Absolutely. You, you you brought up AFCO. I think a lot of people watching this may not be familiar with what AFCO is. And I know that you've been to some AFCO meetings, I think this month or last month. Um, yeah. So could you tell us what AFCO is? Uh, and was there any anything pressing from those meetings that, that you could share with us? Uh, AFCO stands for the Association of American Feed Control Officials. It is an independent organization whose members are State Department of Agriculture representatives and FDA. So pet food is regulated on a federal level by the FDA and on a state level. And on a state level, it can really vary from state to state. It's, it's really crazy. Um, AFCO was originally developed more than 100 years ago to try to get uniform regulations, uniform uh, governance over feed, livestock feed initially, um, across the states. Well, here we are more than 100 years later, and it's still not. It's ridiculous. But AFCO writes laws. It's a private organization, which is just mind-boggling to me, that a private organization writes legal definitions of feed ingredients, uh, including pet food ingredients, and writes like labeling laws, so forth. They are given that authority to write laws. The laws are then adopted into state laws. In some states, yes. In some states, no. It's it's just this madhouse of who knows what. Uh, uh, manufacturers, they their label might be accepted in one state, and it won't be accepted in another state. And they either can't sell it in the in the second state, or they have to. Um, change their label just for this one particular state. These companies also, the good, think of a, a good small company that is trying to put as much money as they can into their ingredients. They're buying humanely raised, uh, organic, you know, everything, human grade. And then they, for every, like the state of New York, for every single product that they sell, every different pet food style, a chicken, a beef, a pork, uh, a topper, a treat, every treat, they have to pay $200 per product per year. That's just to sell in New York. Now, then you do all these different states. Every company has to register in each state. In the majority of the states, Florida, as example, only charges a per manufacturer fee, but a lot of states charge per product. And it's insane. These companies, small good companies are having to pay $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year just to be able to sell their products, which who pays for that ultimately but us. Mm -hmm. And what are pet owners getting out of it? Nothing, because they're not enforcing law. And so you actually attend, you actually attend these AFCO meetings um, on yeah. our behalf, which is pretty incredible. Um, and you went to, I know that there were some updates and changes in this, in this last one, I believe. Um, I think I saw you post about that, which is interesting, but I think that's pretty incredible that, you know, we as pet parents have 
uh, an advocate like yourself that can go in there and and uh, how do they how do they receive you and and how do they accept you and because I know that that you you must be well known uh, among the the committee. Several years ago, I got to uh, it's like three days worth of meetings. You have to pay five hundred dollars to walk in the door. Wow. Nevertheless, your airfare, hotel. Uh, meals away from home, so forth. So I got to this session late and there was chairs in the back and this young woman was sitting there and she motioned, come here, and she moved her stuff out of a chair so I could sit in the chair next to her. I had no idea who she was. And whatever the discussion was, there are microphones in the middle of the room. There's a big table in the front where all the members of that particular committee are all sitting and and then there's microphones out in the audience and if anybody has a comment on the discussion so i went up and, and made my comment and when i come back and sit down this woman that i didn't know leaned over and went why don't people like you and, and i went what and she said yeah when you went up to the microphone everybody around here is kept saying, why is she here? They shouldn't let her in. She has no business being here. So that's how <laughs> I'm treated at AFCO. I mean, it's some of the people, I have to say, but it's few, uh, are very nice. The president, new president of AFCO, came up to me personally at this January meeting and said, under my watch, we're going to do things differently. The last president was as about as nasty as they can get. I mean, he, I even tried, he gave a speech at a meeting a year ago when he first became president about how we all work together and we might not agree and blah, blah. So I went up to him that evening and I said, well, based on today, um, you know, can we work together? And he just stood there and stared at me. And after about 30 seconds, I went, okay, <laughs> message received. So it, it's hard. Um, for many years, I was like the only one there in the lion's den. Uh, now there are more that, that come. Um, I've had my life threatened, no kidding. Um, they threatened to kill my daughter while I was at an AFCO meeting. I walked into one one time and my phone buzzed as soon as I walked in. And I get this text that says, glad you made it. I have no idea who sent this text. And then that same number then later threatened a friend of mine. Uh, so it, it's a lot of money. And, and I'm in there demanding transparency fine. If you want to use dead animal carcasses, ground up dead animal carcasses, fine. Just disclose that on the label because yeah. the consumer deserves to know what they're buying. And, and that upsets um, the apple cart. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, so speaking on kind of pet food, a slight pivot, <laughs> um, and again, I, I just, I'm just, i sorry you had to go through all that, but I, I cannot express to you how much it means to so many of us that you do that um, and share what you learn, I think is also important. Um, but a slight pivot, because I want to make sure we talk a little bit about this um, into processed versus ultra processed food. And I think this is a really important topic because that term is being used a lot more and more and in, in, in my world of kind of being all over social media of processed food and ultra processed, but I don't think that most people really understand what that means and the implications um, that that has on the food nutrient quality. Um, kind of high level, could you explain kind of the difference between process, ultra processed, extrusion, et cetera? I've got a post if your listeners want to look it up. It's titled, Is Your Pet's Food Processed? or ultra processed. And that sort of breaks it down. Um, but it, there is a, it's, it's a human food classification system between minimally processed, 
processed and ultra processed. And it's called a NOVA, N-O-V-A system. And when you read that, now this is all for human food, but I applied that NOVA system already established to pet food ingredients and worked it out. So um, heavily processed, like a, a, a chicken um, cooked, roasted, grilled, that's actually roasted or grilled, would be minimally processed you know that that's that's fine but uh a chicken meal that is starting off with a diseased or non-slaughtered or uh, leftover carcass that is then ground cooked put into a pet food that's cooked again uh, that's ultra processed and ultra processed is scientifically linked ultra processed foods are scientifically linked to a lot of disease. Yes. Um, and, you know, when you have, so how I kind of look at it um, is on, you know, we have processed food, which processed, I think, has such a negative connotation. But if you take a raw piece of chicken breast and you cut it in half, it's kind of processed in a sense, right? It's altered from its original state. Um, but I think the context we're talking about is that we have pro different levels of processed and ultra processed being the most common type of pet food, which is highly extruded, cooked at extremely high temperatures, overly processed, cooked through multiple um, times, kibble. Right. Um, and what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that that food, ultra processed, most kibbles out there. Um, goes through so many processing steps that you're really denaturing proteins, the nutrients aren't as bioavailable, um, and is scientifically linked to diseases um, in our dogs, which is which is interesting because if we look at the most common dis canine diseases in dogs right now, like they're growing at epidemic levels, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, et cetera, um, as kibble becomes more prevalent. Is, is that a good way to explain it? Uh, yeah, I, it, it's, it, and it, the science has not linked pet foods, ultra processed pet foods to disease. The science, it, you know, most of the science is done for humans, yeah. but the science has linked ultra processed foods to disease in humans. Okay, so, uh, but we're making that correlation there. Um, like cancer research, a lot of cancer research is done on dogs because the disease and treatment is pretty similar between dogs and humans. So we, we, I just made that same jump of, of the human food descriptions of what minimally processed, processed and ultra processed, what the differences are, and I transferred them to pet foods. Yeah. And I think that's a fair, a fair way to look at it. I mean, we share what 80, 85% of DNA with, with canines. And I think a lot of it is, is common sense. Like for us and how we would eat, um, we know that the less processed the food generally, the better, um, and the same for dogs. So I don't think, you know, well, I can't speak for you, but for me and like, for those watching, like I'm not anti all kibble. And if you're feeding kibble, you're a horrible person by any means. But I think what we're trying to say is that one ingredients are important, how it's sourced, everything we talked about before, but two, there are different levels of how it's processed and the less processed it is. You mentioned this earlier, a baked uh, kibble, or maybe I know it's not quite kibble, but like freeze dried or, or air dried are a little bit less processed Then you get up to like gently cooked, which is even less right. processed, and then you get raw. So there's these different kind of categories of food, um, most popular being the probably lower nutrient density. Um, so I think what we're saying is like the less processed we can do, the better. Or, and I'd love your thoughts on this, I imagine you're similar. If you are feeding an ultra processed kibble, which again is most kibble out there, um, maybe removing five to 10% of that bowl, the kibble out of the bowl and replacing it with pet safe, real whole fresh foods. What are your that's thoughts right. on that? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a very affordable way 
to do it as well. You know, that's, that's a great way of doing it. Yeah. Cause I've seen some comments like, oh, you know, cause I know you have your pet food list and all your links and everything will be linked below for anybody um, wanting to, to, to do that or to get to learn more from you, which I encourage them to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I get some comments cause I'll share brands that I personally would feed my dogs and people will say, oh, you know, those are so cost prohibitive. And for me, it's like, you're right, right? Like we're pet food in my opinion, shouldn't be cheap. Um, I don't think it needs to be overpriced for what it is, but I mean, you are feeding a, a real living creature and pet, big pet food has um, created monsters out of us and led us to believe that like our dog should be eating the same bag of really inexpensive kibble forever. But I also recognize that everybody's in a different life situation. So there are amazing, um, easy ways to what we would say, like boost the bowl. So I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and then I know we're kind of getting close on time, but are there any pressing things that you, I mean, we, so we just had a further recall that was just, uh, that just came out for Purina and the elevated vitamin D, which I'm still hoping not, but my, still waiting if more comes out from that. Um, hoping it not though. Um, and then, Royal Canin's feline um, recall, which all that stuff will be linked down below for anybody hearing this for the first time. Um, any notable things that we should take away from that or things to look out for um, other than obviously looking at the lot codes if we're feeding that and, and discontinue feeding it? Recalls, they do happen, you know, but for, to me, for prescription pet food, a pet food that you're really has the same ingredients as any other food. Um, they're feed grade. They're not human grade, but it costs four times, three times as much more. For those foods not to have quality control in place that would allow a product to go to store shelves and undoubtedly kill some pets with excess vitamin D, there is no excuse, absolutely no excuse. So um, that that one is, I just shake my head because there's there's absolutely no excuse. They should have such quality control in place, but they do not. Yeah, it's unfortunate and it's scary. Um, and I hope that we don't hear of more coming out from that because I know a lot of manufacturers will share the same uh, manufacturer of, uh, these synthetics and these vitamins. So I hope that absolutely, yeah. I hope it's, I hope it's a one-off, um, and we don't hear more. Well, that's um, part of their trace forward, trace backwards investigation. That's what they're probably doing right now, okay. is tracing back to see which supplement provider provided it, where the error happened, um, did this same batch go to somebody else? So I'm sure they're in the process of investigating that now. Yeah. Um, and I do want to take one question. It's from um, uh, Angie uh, Ardolino of CBD Dog Health because she is an awesome human being. And she has an interesting question. It's a little, un <laughs> a little unrelated, but I, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on it because I have been seeing um, her question is, uh, for those of us who kind of know better, what's the truth about HPP in your thoughts? Um and she said, we went from fighting the FDA to two years later, the same people who were fighting are now saying it's okay. Um, she would love, you know, to kind of get your thoughts on that. And do you have plans to add to your list, whether our food HPP is or not, is what her question was. Well, uh, HPP is, is a processing, okay? It's high pressure pasteurization, you know, depends on, Who you ask. I've, I've heard it phrased differently depending yeah. on the individual, but it is a, a processing and it's used to kill pathogenic bacteria. Meats are, that's the nature of the beast, meats are, meats are prone to pathogenic bacteria. Okay, and it's the slaughter process. It's a lot of different things, but that's part of the deal. In human food, um, the USDA regulates meats in human food, and the USDA acknowledges that pathogenic bacteria is just part of the package, and they allow a certain percentage, okay, per 
facility, per slaughter facility. The FDA, who regulates pet food, has a zero tolerance for pathogenic bacteria. So pet foods cannot contain any pathogenic bacteria. If the FDA finds any, you, you have to recall. So manufacturers, because there was recall and, and FDA is looking with a magnifying glass at all raw pet foods, um, manufacturers were in between a rock and a hard place. Risk, uh, you know, being held to a standard higher than human food uh, based on pathogenic bacteria, um, do something to treat your food. We don't want to cook it. But we don't want to risk pathogenic bacteria and having to do a recall and FDA down our backs. Um, it, it, it's, you know, to me, I, I, I'm not that opposed to it. I know some people are. I would prefer it not to be used. If, if you're feeding raw, you want to stick with that minimally processed. Um, and probably HPP would fall into the category of still minimally processed. But if you add several minimal processes, then you've moved into a step of then you're a processed food. So the, the more steps you can get away from, the better. But um, it, it's six of one half dozen the other. It just depends on the individual. I think that's a, a personal choice yeah. as to whether you want that or not. Very well said. That's, that's a great, um, this has been fantastic. I, can, <laughs> I, I have so many other things I want to bring up, but I want to respect your time. So I'm going to end it there. Um, but I would love to have you on again. And for those watching, if you have specific questions, um, please drop those below because I'll pull those and either reply back and or um, maybe we'll be lucky enough to have Susan back on because I <laughs> I could talk to you for days and it's 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 very surreal because I've been a big fan and follower of your work for a long time, but kind of from the shadows and it's just surreal to kind of have you here and I hope that we can meet in person one day. Um, Come to but, an um, AFCO meeting. Where are they at? Where is this? It depends. In, in August, it'll be in Baltimore. I might do that. Yeah, that come to an AFCO meeting. Okay. Yeah. That, consider this. Yeah, like why not? That would be I like to pull people down the rabbit hole with me. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> hey, that would be fantastic. Okay. That, okay. This is exciting. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, again, I, I'm honored to have you. Very thankful. All of your information, your links to your truth about pet food, your dog food list, everything will be linked down below. Please, for the, anybody watching, um, support what she's doing. She is a Susan Thixton is a rarity, uh, and we are lucky to have her in our corner. Um, and with that, don't forget to follow, subscribe, share this so we can help inform um, and empower pet parents around the world. And Susan, 